let's talk about cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12. So cranial nerve 9 is the first one that we're going to go with the glossal pharyngeal nerve. Now this nerve, I'm going to use the same picture for teaching this whole thing, it's going to arise from the medulla oblongata um, along with cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12, so there's 9, and it's going to course through this opening called the jugular foramen, and it's shown in yellow in the bottom of the picture there of the base of the skull. And it has the following functions when it exits. It's got a bunch of functions, like it innervates one muscle called the stylopharyngeus muscle that's derived from the third branchial arch. Rises from the styloid process, goes to the pharynx, and helps elevate the pharynx when you're swallowing. It also does visceral motor, which is parasympathetic innervation to the parotid gland. So the facial nerve does all the glands in the head except that one, the parotid gland. Um, so it helps make saliva. It also is going to do taste to the posterior third of the tongue and also general sensation to the posterior third of the tongue, but also the oral pharynx right along the back of your throat and then part of the opening of your auditory or eustachian tube. And then it also does visceral sensory from the carotid sinus and the carotid body that we've talked about, which the carotid sinus does um, baroreceptor for changing, uh, for measuring changes in blood pressure. Chemoreceptor is the carotid body, which measures changes of CO2 and O2 in the blood. Now, when it comes to the clinical relevance of all of these functions, the oral pharynx and the carotid sinus and body is really it. That's it. All the other things, though, have some relevance when it comes to really clinical testing it's the sensation general sensation to the oral pharynx the back of your throat and then the carotid sinus and body the oral pharynx because it initiates the gag reflex if you touch the back of the throat that's the sensory limb to the gag reflex which you contract your pharynx and then the carotid sinus and body for measuring blood pressure and um, oxygen and co2 for the baroreceptor reflex in the body so Pardon me. That's for the glossal pharyngeal nerve. So you got all those functions. Those are the three things that you'll be tested on uh, for exams and most likely for your boards. Next one is the vagus nerve, cranial nerve number 10. Now this one also arises from the medulla, 9, 10, 11, and 12, basically associated with the medulla oblongata, courses through that same opening, the jugular foramen, along with 9, 10, and 11. And uh, you see the jugular frame in that base of the skull in yellow at the bottom. And then it's called the wanderer, vagus for vagabond, because it has the following functions. It'll go and innervate muscles that are associated with the palate, muscles associated with your pharynx, and muscles associated with your larynx. So pharynx for swallowing, larynx for speech. Two very relevant features. It also is going to do visceral motor to your thoracic and abdominal viscera that we've talked about. So it slows the heart down, constricts your um, airways, and also for foregut and midgut is going to be associated with digestion, glands, peristalsis, and so forth. It also does general sensation from the laryngopharynx and larynx, which is anything that touches the top of your larynx, initiates a cough reflex. Um, to make sure you don't get food or fluids that go down your wrong airway, the wrong pipe. And then also visceral sensation from thoracic and abdominal viscera. Um, now, out of all those, what is the most clinically relevant? These ones. Muscles of the palate, pharynx, and larynx for swallowing and speaking. Very, very important concepts uh, or things to look for in a physical exam. And then general sensation from their lingopharynx or larynx. If it's not functioning, people can asphyxiate on fluids that touch the top of the larynx. So those are the two primary clinical things. Not that visceral motor to thoracic and abdominal viscera is not important, but because the enteric nervous system works so well, it plays a big part that it can run on its own. So the clinical finding then is motor function to pharynx, larynx, and palate via the loss of the gag reflex. Next one is spinal accessory nerve. So this one is going to uh, arise from the cervical cord, course through the green opening, which is the foramen magnum, big base of the skull, and then course back down through the jugular foramen along with 9 and 10, and then innervate your sternocleidomastoid muscle, turns your 
the right sternocleidal acid allows you to look over the left shoulder and vice versa. And the trapezius, which is for shrugging your shoulder. And so the clinical findings then is if you have not got your spinal accessory nerve, weakness in shrugging the shoulder or rotating the head to look over the opposite shoulder. And finally, the hypoglossal nerve. This one is also going to rise from the dula oblongata and then course through this hypoglossal canal. And it innervates all the tongue muscles from your styloglossus, tyoglossus, to the genioglossus. Now, the genioglossus, which I have an asterisk, is the most clinically relevant one. Genio for chin, glossus for tongue. It goes from the mandible, your chin, to the tongue. And this muscle moves your tongue out of your mouth, protrudes it. So the bottom picture shows the right and the left genioglossus muscle. Notice that the muscle goes to the chin, uh, to the inside of the uh, mental symphysis of the mandible at an angle. But that two angles coming together creates a vector that pushes your tongue forward as if going meh and sticking your tongue right out of your mouth. Now, if you knock out one side, so loss of motor function to the tongue when protruding it, it deviates to the same side, which means if you knock out one genioglossus muscle, when you protrude your tongue, the tongue deviates to the side of the lesion because of the way those vectors work. So the way you remember this is you lick your wounds with the hypoglossal nerve injury. If you knock out the right hypoglossal nerve, you knock out the right genioglossus, so when you stick your tongue out of your mouth, the tongue deviates to the right. So there we have hypoglossal nerve.